I'm Jay Elias, General Legal Counsel at Dyer Lake Funeral Home in North Attleboro. Welcome to this episode of Live and Learn, a series of programs designed to be informative, educational, and upbeat, and always intended to enhance and encourage our personal wellness and awareness. Here's a short but maybe a complicated question for you to consider. What makes you, you? On the one hand, the answer can be somewhat superficial. It's your good looks, your charming personality, your dazzling smile, your sense of humor, or maybe your candor and brutal honesty. Or your answer might be more profound and philosophical, requiring a bit more thoughtfulness. Maybe it's founded on spiritual beliefs or even scientific evidence. We all have an awareness of our self, differentiating ourselves from one another. The notion of individuality is well ingrained in us from a young age, whether our name was sewn into our mittens and coats, written on a classroom cubbyhole, or when choosing sides playing kickball. But what makes you, you? If you had said it was your charming personality, has that changed over the years? Has your sense of humor gone from raucous to witty? Have your spiritual beliefs been tested or compromised over a lifetime? If what makes you you is what you look like, how much has your physical appearance changed over the years? When you look in the mirror, do you see the same person you saw 20 years ago? Maybe with more lines and creases, or maybe with grayer hair, or maybe less hair. Maybe you're heavier or thinner than you used to be, but still, when you look at yourself in the mirror, do you still see the same you that you've been seeing all these years? Or does what make you you have absolutely nothing to do with your physical appearance? Is it your spirit, your soul, your mind, your unique perspective on life? And is there only one real you? Maybe there are several different versions of you depending on your circumstances or in whose company you are. Is there a you when there's no one around? A you when you're with your immediate family as opposed to your extended family? A you they know at work and one in moments of quiet reflection at church? Or a you when you're in a social function? Do you consider that you are maybe an amalgam of many factors such as your genetic makeup, your environment, education, friends, and your life's experiences. Would you say that the core you has changed over time? Maybe it's hard for you to relate to the you of your childhood. Or is the fundamental essence of you the same? Maybe just softened or hardened by your life experiences. Would your childhood friends or classmates from your early years recognize you all these years later Maybe you do still have the same glint in your eyes or your somewhat skewered sense of humor. Is the same old you still in there? Let's begin with a bit of a scientific view of the question, what makes you, you? We know that the human body replaces its own cells regularly and that our bodies are made up of trillions of cells. About 70% of those by mass are fat and muscle and they last an average of 12 to 50 years, respectively, and we have many more tiny cells in our blood, for example, some of which live only a matter of days or weeks. All in all, more than 300 billion cells are replaced daily. That's about 1% of all our cells. So consider this. If you think that what makes you, you, is found in your physical structure, then arguably there's a new you every 80 to 100 days. But chances are when we talk about what makes you, you, you weren't thinking quite so technically. Let's say though, in the not too distant future, we have the ability to completely clone ourselves. You're given the opportunity to have several perfect copies of you created in the lab. Which one of those clones would you say is the real you? Or would the original you be the only real you. And if that's your response, that is that the only original version is the real you, why is that? It could be said that your personality exists because of your brain, or maybe you'd say it's because of your mind. Is it your brain or your mind that makes you you? 
It may be that because your brain stores your memories and controls your thought processes, that's what you would consider to be the primary basis of who you are, what it is that makes you you, your mind. If that's the case, what happens if you have a traumatic brain injury, for example? Some say they no longer feel like they used to. They're not the same person as they were before the incident. Is the former you gone, replaced by a new you, even though to the outside world you look the same? Would you no longer be the same you if your memories were no longer there, for example, or your speech or movement were affected? Even if inside you, you still felt like you. Maybe you'd be you, only different. And by the way, as we know, when you look at yourself in the mirror and you see you, it's not really the same you that we see when we look at you. We know that our appearance is reversed when we look in the mirror. And by the way, we also know that for most of us, our features aren't even remotely symmetric. Did you know that seeing yourself in the mirror is in and of itself a rather remarkable feat? When you look in the mirror, you see yourself, maybe an older, heavier version of you, but you know it's you. The eyes are the same, the facial features may have changed over time, but it's you that you see. And that puts you in the company of very few animals, dolphins, elephants, chimpanzees, and magpies. All of them have shown the ability to recognize their own reflections. The mirror test is often used as a way of measuring whether animals possess something called self-awareness. Most animals generally can't do it. For example, a dog looking in a mirror sees another dog, not itself. They don't possess self-awareness like we do. And it's been said that our sense of self may also derive from language. We use language to communicate with others and to think to ourselves. At around age two or three, children begin talking out loud in a way that's clearly not intended to communicate to others. They seem to use this self-talk to direct their own behavior. And within a few years, they learn to turn that self-talk inward. And from then on, they and we maintain an internal monologue. We all engage in this inner speech. When we read, we hear our own voice speaking the words. When we work on a problem, we talk out the steps in our head. As we go through the day, we make, make comments about the people we meet that we would never dare say out loud. This running monologue inside the head is a part of what constitutes the self and what makes you you. Unfortunately, sometimes we think we're self-talking when somebody nearby says, were you talking to me? Language gives us the ability to create a narrative that ties together all the experiences in our life into a coherent whole. And we identify this self-story of ours as our core essence, that is, who we are. Although our bodies change over time, we experience the self as immutable, unmoving. And that's why when we look in a mirror at any age, we see someone we know. Consider this. Every moment of your life, your brain is actively rewiring. You have about 86 billion neurons and a fraction of a quadrillion connections between them. Those vast seas of connections are constantly changing their strength and they're unconnecting and reconnecting elsewhere. And that may be why you're a slightly different person than you were a day ago, a week ago, or a year ago. When you learn something new during the course of a day, there's an actual physical change in the structure of your brain, and it's called brain plasticity or neuroplasticity. It has nothing to do with plastics. It's a term used by neuroscientists to refer to our brain's ability to change at any age for better or for worse. And as you would imagine, this flexibility plays an incredibly important role in our brain development or its decline and in shaping our distinct personalities and who we are. Changes in the physical brain manifest as changes in our abilities. For example, each time we learn a new dance step, it reflects a change in our physical brain. New wires 
or neural pathways that give instructions to our bodies on how to perform the step. Each time we forget someone's name, it reflects a brain change. Wires that maybe were once connected to the memory have been degraded or severed. So is there a new you every dance step along the way? Is it your genetic composition, your DNA that makes you you? And is what makes you you similar to what makes me me? There are few areas of science more fiercely contested than the issue of what makes us who we are. Are we products of our environment or the embodiment of our genes? You've heard it. Is it nature or nurture? Most agree that it's a mixture of both, but there's been no end of disagreement about which is the more dominant influence. It's been surmised by some psychologists and scientists that the key to your personality traits doesn't lie in how you were treated by your parents, for example, but rather in what you inherited from them, that is, the genes in your DNA. And although there's long been relatively widespread acceptance that our genes determine our physiology for good and bad, there's long been controversy surrounding the subject of our psychology, that is, our behavior and personality traits. It's one thing to say that your genetic makeup largely determines how fast you run, how high you jump, or how vulnerable you are to something like obesity or poor eyesight. That's the nature side of the nature versus nurture equation of what makes you who you are. But it's another thing to argue that genes also largely determine how caring, empathetic, or social we are. Many prefer to think of those traits as the nurture side of the equation, brought about by how we were raised, schooled, our general social environment into which we happened to have been born. Clearly, both genes and environment, nature versus nurture, each play a role in deciding the differences between a genius and a dunce, a serial killer and a saint. But determining how genes and environment interact to mold our likes and dislikes, our loves and our hates, what makes you, you, is a very complex puzzle. It does appear that genetically we humans are far more alike than we are different. The human genome is a chemical code more than three billion letters in length, written into a spiral ladder-shaped molecule called DNA. And remarkably, it's estimated that the sequence of those letters in the genomes of any two individuals is actually more than 99% identical. But because this human genome is so large, even the smallest of fractional differences from one person to the next can amount to millions of variations in who they are. And these inherited variations account for much of the differences between us. Here's a thought. So because human genomes differ from one another by less than 1%, it would seem that's a very small amount. But in the world of genetics, it's quite significant. So, although we humans share a remarkable similarity in our DNA, we're all the same, and yet we're all very different. How's that for ambiguity? And here's a thought. Humans and chimpanzees share more than 99% of the same DNA. So what about identical twins? Identical twins often do share personality traits, interests, and habits. They come from the same fertilized egg. They share the same genetic blueprint. To a standard DNA test, they appear almost indistinguishable. But any forensic expert will tell you that there is at least one surefire way to tell them apart. Identical twins don't have matching fingerprints. Like physical appearance and personality, fingerprints are largely shaped by a person's DNA and by a variety of environmental forces. Genetics helps determine the general pattern on a fingertip, arches, loops, and whirls. And speaking of fingerprints, they remain unchanged throughout your life. They truly are something that makes you uniquely you. And for that reason, your fingerprints are an important tool for law enforcement. We've all seen enough movies or TV to know that shortly after someone is booked for a crime, the police often take an inked impression of each of the suspect's fingerprints and run those prints through a database 
looking for prior arrests and convictions. The computer checks for two different and distinctive features, whorls and ridges. But the criminal mind being what it is, criminals have for years found myriad ways to alter their fingerprints. Actually, one of the most famous ones in the 1930s was the infamous bank robber John Dillinger. He poured acid into cuts in his fingertips in an effort to erase those whorls and ridges that were unique to him. And after he was shot and killed by the Chicago police, experts discerned a few of the remaining ridges and patterns and identified him very easily. Over the years, other criminals have had their fingerprints surgically altered, burned, lasers, cut to obliterate this identifying, uniquely identifying feature. So now, law enforcement has available something called a major case print, which is a linked, I'm sorry, an inked impression of a person's entire hand. So you can't just alter your fingertips. And in addition, technology has advanced significantly, and now we use facial recognition computer software. Here's another question for you. Is it your heart at the core of what makes you, you? Do you think it would make you feel like a different person if you received a heart transplant from another person? Or would you feel like the same you only with the gift of a donor's organ? And what if you learned that the donor was a serial killer or maybe a renowned athlete? And would your answer be any different if you received a kidney, a liver, or a cornea transplant? For some people, when we speak of a heart transplant, it takes on a very different meaning because whether it's in literature or religious verse or musical lyrics, our heart is often thought of as a source of our emotions. For many, the focus of their personality and their very being is somehow connected to their heart. Follow what your heart tells you. Start each day with a grateful heart. She broke his heart just to name a few. To gain insight into the question of whether heart transplant patients felt a change in personality after having received a donor heart, dozens of individuals who underwent heart transplants in Vienna, Austria, were interviewed. Three groups of patients were identified. 80% of those heart transplant recipients stated that their personality had absolutely not changed postoperatively. 15% stated that their personality had changed, but not because of the heart, but because of the life-threatening event that they went through. And only 5% reported a recognizable change of personality due to their new hearts. The ancient Egyptians noticed that the veins and arteries, as well as many nerves, radiate outward from the heart and concluded that it was central to both reason and emotion. And the ancient Romans, they believed that a vein extended from the fourth finger of the left hand directly to the heart. They called it the vein of love. And their knowledge of human anatomy was a little bit off because it doesn't quite work that way, but the myth persisted. And wearing a wedding ring on that finger goes back all the way to the Romans and to medieval England. It seems that for many of us, our heart, our emotions, and our sense of self are in some way closely linked. So, is it your heart that makes you you? Or maybe it's your life's experiences that makes you you. Think about this. When a 95-year-old woman looks at a picture in a family photo album and immediately recognizes herself as that fresh-faced, innocent five-year-old in the picture, how is it that she feels instantly connected to that young child after all these years? You know, at first blush, that 95-year-old woman and the five-year-old child in the picture seem to have very little in common. After all, physically, they're vastly different. And almost every cell in the five-year-old's body has been replaced over the many decades. As far as their personalities are concerned, could there be much in common? If that 95-year-old woman today were to sit down next to that five-year-old girl of years before and engage in a conversation, would they have anything to say to one another? Could they relate in any way? It seemed that most any other 95-year-old person on the street would have more in common with that 95-year-old woman than in her distant self. 
But maybe it's not about the similarities, but about the continuity in the woman's life experiences that so readily connects her to her five-year-old self she sees in the photo. Maybe what she shares with her five-year-old self in the picture is something she shares with no one else on earth. They were connected to each other by a long, unbroken string of a continuous existence, like a long chain of overlapping memories, personality traits, physical characteristics. It's like having an old wooden boat. Think about it. Over the years, maybe you've repaired that old wooden boat hundreds of times, replacing every single plank of wood until one day you realize there's not one piece of material from that original boat that makes up your rowboat. So is it in fact your same trusted boat? And let's say you name that boat the SS Minnow, the day you bought it and you kept its same name over all the years. Wouldn't you still think of it as the SS Minnow, even if not one part of that boat could be traced to its original structure? Maybe then what makes that 95-year-old woman and any of us who are who we are at any point in our life, it's less about the static self at any moment in time, and maybe it's more about the story of our life, the progression and theme of our person, constantly changing, but like that old wooden boat, the same, yet different. And maybe what connects the 95-year-old woman and that five-year-old child was their soul. However you may choose to define and interpret what a soul is, and maybe that's the most essential part of you, which constitutes your unique personality. And maybe it's your personality that makes you you. Between adolescence and adulthood, you go through a host of changes, jobs, regrettable haircuts, relationships that come and go. As you grow older, though, does your personality change or do you have at your core the same personality throughout your lifetime? It's been thought of as the pattern of our thoughts, feelings, and behaviors that's unique to you. People tend to think of personality as fixed, but according to many psychologists, that's not really how it works. Instead, personality is a developmental phenomenon, not static. In the short term, changes can be nearly imperceptible, and research suggests that our personality is actually stable on short-term scales. Researchers analyzed the results of hundreds of studies on personality, which followed participants ranging in age from childhood to the early 70s. And each of the studies measured trends in what are referred to as the big five personality traits. Extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, openness to experience, and neuroticism. They found that levels of each personality trait relative to other participants actually tended to stay consistent within each decade of our life. And that pattern of consistency began around age three when psychologists called them not personality traits but a child's temperament, that is the intensity of a person's reaction to the world. We come into the world with unique temperaments and research suggests that our temperaments as children, for example, whether easygoing or prone to temper tantrums, corresponds to adult personality traits. And although a shy three-year-old will act very differently from a shy 20-something, there's apparently an underlying core that stays stable. In 1960, psychologists surveyed over 400,000 high school students, 5% of all the students in the country at the time. And the students answered questions about everything from how they reacted to emotional situations to how efficiently they got work done. 50 years later, researchers tracked down almost 2,000 2, of those former students and gave them the exact same survey. The results found that in their 60s, participants scored much higher than they had as teenagers on questions measuring calmness, self-confidence, leadership, and social sensitivity. So it seems that our personality generally tends to get better over time, and it's called the maturity principle. People become more extroverted, emotionally stable, agreeable, and conscientious as they grow older. 
And here's a question for you. Do your secrets make you you? If you're like almost every other person in the world, the real you has secrets. It doesn't necessarily mean they're deep, dark secrets, but survey after survey tells us that we all apparently have one secret or another, actually more than that. So the question is this, can you be the real you if you have secrets that you aren't sharing with anyone else? One published study found that the average person is holding on to, wait for this, 13 secrets. And of those, the survey of several thousand people found that five of those secrets have never been shared with another living soul. Sure, a secret is a secret, but very often people share some of their secrets with their closest confidants. Studies have also found that it's probably not the secret that will haunt you for as long as you hold it. It's the mental energy you spend thinking about it. And it's been shown that the burden of holding secrets can affect you in ways you might have never considered. Some people actually feel physically heavier when they're burdened with a, think, a secret. Think about it. People do often have a curious way of talking about secrets as weighing them down or burdening them. And it seems that for some of us, when we're thinking about our secrets, we actually act as if we're physically burdened by them. And I'll leave you with this thought. The reasons for concealing information secrets are as varied as the secrets themselves. People claim it's because of shame or protecting privacy, protecting oneself or others from being hurt, avoiding conflict, social stigma, gaining advantage in a specific area of their life, a whole host of reasons. So after all that, what makes you you? Maybe it really is your charming personality. I'm Jay Elias. Thank you for watching this episode of Live and Learn. I hope you enjoyed this. I look forward to your joining me again for another program designed to enhance and encourage your personal wellness and awareness. Until then, remember, it's never too late to learn. And consider this. It's been said that two things define us, our patience when we have nothing and our attitude when we have everything. And although our past may shape us, it does not define the person who we now are.